All right, so chapter 14 is basically, it's just a continuation from chapter 13. Uh, as you can see, even just in the very first verse there, in chapter 14 it says, For the Lord will have mercy. This is continuing a thought, obviously, right? So it's not even just starting off something brand new. And I've mentioned this before, there's lots of different chunks throughout the book of Isaiah. And where we're at this evening, if you remember going all the way back to chapter 1, the, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, the Bible says, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So the first, all the way up until where we are right now, we, we've been able to see, and there's been references to the time periods at, you know, at each break. I'm not going to go through all those again. We already went through that as we covered each chapter. But Jotham, excuse me, Isaiah, Jotham, and now Ahaz. Ahaz dies basically like right at the at the at this prophecy here essentially so it's right, right around the time of this prophecy being delivered ahaz dies so that means the rest of the book of isaiah now is going to cover the time span of king hezekiah so as i mentioned before you know if you wanted to to try to line up some of these events and these prophecies that are coming to isaiah and he's preaching uh to see where they fit within the kings and chronicles uh that's that you could do that it's interesting to do that there's a lot more you could learn but that's a, that requires a much deeper uh, Bible study. But from, from 15 on, essentially, is going to be prophecies that take place during the time of Hezekiah. So I just wanted to point that out. As well as uh, last week, we uh, looked at chapter 13, which starts off with the burden of Babylon. And then I spent a lot of time going into the day of the Lord because that's what was mentioned there. Now, I focused primarily on the future prophecy of the day of the Lord. But I, I also, you know, I, brought, I mentioned it briefly, and I'm going to mention it again, because every time we go through Old Testament prophecy, it's very important to understand that it's not just solely about future events. Future events are what we're more interested in because it hasn't happened yet, right? Uh, but, but you can't deny also the prophecies that are, that are happening for the, the time that was then present as well, because there's so many multifaceted prophecies that are built into God's Word. God's Word is deep and is amazing that you, could even, you can even have these correlations and these uh, relations uh, of, of events that happened in the, in the past as well as applying to future prophetic events. So I'm also going to be spending, since last week we looked at chapter 13, which was heavily dealing with the day of the Lord, this is dealing with now after the day of the Lord. And just as we're also going to see dual prophecies going on here, because last week we saw the reference to Babylon, it was the burden of Babylon, and in reference to the, the captivity of the children of Israel going to Babylon. And now we're going to see references of freedom from Babylon, right, which is, which is literally going to happen. It was still prophetic in the future during the time of Isaiah, because the children of Israel had not been taken captive yet. They, you know, the captivity came more in like Jeremiah's day. That's when, when the captivity came. It definitely wasn't during the reigns of the kings that we see Isaiah's preaching through, right? Hezekiah's the last king. Well, you still have to go um, uh, you know, a, little, a little ways off until you get into the kings that are ruling and reigning by the time Babylon comes in and takes, takes them captive. So... Isaiah's warning about this captivity. He's warning about the, you know, the, the days that are to come. And, and he, you know, is preaching against Babylon. He's going to preach against Assyria. He's preaching against all these different lands. And those are all very, very relevant for the time that was then present for the near-term future. But it's also very important as a foreshadowing of events still yet to come. And only God can write, have things come out in such a way that it's perfectly relevant to, to both. It's amazing. So we're going to dig into chapter 40. And like I said, as I did last week, I'm going to spend some time focusing on more of the future stuff. But probably an equal amount of time could be spent just highlighting how these prophecies were already fulfilled in the past with, with the events that happened already. Because that also is amazing, just seeing God at work. I mean, through, through his prophecy, through things that not only haven't happened yet, but things have already happened. There's so, many, there's so much prophecy in the word of God, 
I mean, that's, how, that's one of the ways you prove and you know it's God because when God speaks, his word comes to pass. And all of these things happened far enough in advance for Isaiah's day. You didn't, they didn't know Babylon was going to come and take them captive you know, other than through the word of the Lord because it was still far enough off into the future that that was going to happen and they were going to be judged. But um, so, so, I mean, that in itself is, is pretty amazing. But let's, let's look at this. Just keeping all of that in mind. I just kind of want to set the pace for the rest of the sermon, uh, just so that it's clear, because a lot of times what I'm going to be focusing on may not be the, the surface application for the verses, because it's the, the surface application is probably going to do more with the, 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 the short-term prophecy than the long-term prophecy, right? But I want to glean and see what we can get, what we can, uh, get out of this for, um, for some future prophecy as well. Let's look at that at verse number one. The Bible says, for the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land. And the strangers shall be joined with them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. And the people shall take them and bring them to their place. And the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids. And they shall take them captives whose captives they were and they shall rule over their oppressors. And this is talking about the judgment of Babylon, and this is talking about the children of Israel end up going back to their land and to rebuild the temple, which is exactly what happens, right? They go back to their land, they're brought to their land, and their uh, captives <coughs> become their servants. And this is what happens. However, as I said before, this is also what is going to happen. Keep your place here. Turn if you would to 2 Timothy chapter 2. This is also going to be the way it plays out in end times prophecy as well. When Jesus Christ comes back to set up the millennial reign here on earth is that you know just prior to that reign being set up, the, the saints, the people of God, the Israel of God, the children of Israel, you know, spiritually speaking, the children of God are going to be being persecuted. They're going to be driven out of every land, right? Because all the nations are going to hate them and everybody's going to be coming after, after them, after us, depending on you know, when, when this actually literally takes place. And when Jesus comes back, though, those who were the ones putting you into captivity are be the ones... Now they're going to be in, you know, serving. And I believe that the nations of the land, when Jesus comes back to reign, they're going to be serving us. The, 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 the remnant, whoever is left over, that doesn't get wiped out by the wrath of God, it, that's going to still be alive and remaining on this earth during that millennial reign of Christ, they're going to be working and serving us and we're going to be ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ. And I get that from one place is from 2 Timothy chapter 2, where I do turn. Look at verse number 11. The Bible says, It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Now it says there, if we suffer, which is what's going to be happening to the saints, it says we shall also reign with him. Reign is ruling, right? You're going to be ruling with him. Uh, even more proof is in Revelation 20. When I flip over to, forward to Revelation chapter 20, and we'll get the timing of this as well from Revelation chapter 20. Verse number one, the Bible reads, and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Now, I'm going to pause right here, because this is going to be a point that's going to come up shortly in the sermon, just a little bit later. But I just want to point something out to you about Satan not being bound in hell right now. A lot of people don't understand, you know, where Satan is, what he does. You know, the Bible tells us that, 
that Satan as a, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So we know that for a fact that he walks around. We also know from here that he's not bound and cast into hell until basically the end of God's wrath. And that's when he's going to be sealed and, and chained up and cast into hell. And he's going to be sealed in there. And then he's going to spend a thousand years just burning in hell. But that's when he's going to be cast to hell for the first time. And he has not been cast down to hell yet. And, and there's plenty of evidence for this in Scripture, right? but this is, again, this is going to be important later because we see, as we look at Lucifer and being cast out of heaven and things like that, we're going to look at the timing for that as well. When did he actually get cast out of heaven? Has he been cast out of heaven? We'll get into that in a little bit, but I, I wanted to point this out. This is a slightly different subject where I'm looking forward just to reigning with Jesus Christ here, but in the context of this verse, it's informing us, hey, this is when Satan is going to be cast into hell. And people have this concept of, oh yeah, Satan rules in hell. No, Satan does not rule in hell. Satan hasn't even been to hell. And don't think that you're going to rule and reign with Satan in hell because the only person who rules in hell is God. Guess what? Guess who made hell? It wasn't the devil. Satan didn't create hell for himself because, oh, I like fire. I like it hot and I just want to be warm. Right? And I'm sick of hanging out in Antarctica. I want it to be warm where I live. No. Hell was not designed to be a, a tropical location where you can walk around in your tidy whities all day and, and not have to put anything on because it's so nice and warm. Hell is a place of punishment. Amen. Hell is a place of eternal torture and punishment and darkness and weeping, and wailing, and gnashing of teeth, hell is a horrible place, and it was designed and created for the devil and his angels as a punishment for them. But they have not been cast down there yet, which is even why the devils, when Jesus came and they were casting out devils, you remember, like, especially in the book of Mark, you read this a lot, and they said, I know thee who thou art, art thou come to torment us before the time. Why? Because they weren't being tormented yet. And they know that the day is coming when they're going to be cast into hell and they're going to be tormented and they're saying, what are you doing here? Right? It's not time for us to be tormented yet. What are you doing here? Because guess who's going to be doing the tormenting? Guess who's going to be casting them into hell? Jesus! Jesus is going to be casting people into hell. Jesus is the one that's going to be ruling and reigning. God is in charge. Not the devil. So we got to get this clear. Satan has no authority in hell. And in fact, he's going to be despised and looked down on by everyone in hell when he gets there. But again, I'm going to get too far ahead of myself. I'm trying to just show you here first. Let's get back to the original point. Demonstrating, you know, this prophecy that we read in Isaiah 14 verses 1 and 2 talking about that they're going to take them captives, whose captives they were, just like Jesus led captivity captive, right? He was, he was taken captive, but then turned that into a victory and, and, and turned the tables into, uh, into his death, becoming a victory through his resurrection and, uh, and bearing the sins of the whole world and, and, and paying the price for them. But then his people, you know, yes, they're going to suffer persecution. Yes, they're going to go through hard times. But then... He's going to reward you in the end. Things are going to turn around to be the exact opposite. So yes, you're going to suffer tribulation. Yes, you're going to go through some hard times. Yes, you're going to be persecuted, but then you're going to be ruling and reigning with him. So you're going to suffer a little bit first, but if you suffer with him, you shall reign with him. As it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and then in Revelation chapter 20, we're getting the timing here now of the devil being bound for a thousand years, and what a great time of peace that's going to be because the devil's not going to be wandering around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. You don't have to worry about any attacks from the devil during that millennial reign of Christ because he'll be bound in hell for a thousand years. That alone is great. I mean, imagine a thousand years with no Satan and his devils going around trying to just cause problems in this world and be accusing the brethren. And then it says here, um, in verse number four, and I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, 
and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. So this is talking about this group of people who stayed faithful unto the end. They didn't receive the mark of the beast. These are saints that are tribulation saints. They were alive during the tribulation because they didn't receive the mark. I mean, we wouldn't be bringing that up if it was about someone who died a thousand years ago. Well, of course they didn't receive the mark. <laughs> the mark wasn't being given. There wasn't even a choice. This is the, the people who are coming out of this great tribulation. They're being martyred for Christ. And he's saying, you know, these people, they didn't receive the mark of the beast. They didn't receive it in their foreheads or in their hands. And look at this. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So as a result of them making it through that hard time, hey, now they're reigning and living with Jesus Christ for a thousand years. And who do you think they're reigning over? They'll be reigning over the people who formerly would have been their captors. Now they're the captives. Now they're the ones that are, that, you know, the, look, the people who are ruling and reigning are going to be supported by the people they're reigning over. It's the way it's going to be. And then it says in verse 5, But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Look at this. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Now, if you're saved today, guess what? You're going to take part in that first resurrection. And that's a blessed and holy event. It says, On such a second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So not just the tribulation saints are going to be reigning with Christ, but everybody who is participating in that first resurrection is going to be reigning with Christ and ruling with him. And that's where we get the examples and the, and the, the stories in the New Testament with Jesus Christ, specifically talking about the kingdom of God and, 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 and giving the, the stories of, you know, well done, thou good and faithful servant, thou good and faithful over little, thou be, uh, you know, uh, be thou ruler over much. He's going to give you you know, literally gives examples of people ruling over five cities, over ten cities, right? And, and having that authority and that power during this time of the reign of Christ. So that's, um, we can see how this, this prophecy in Isaiah 14 is going to end up happening. And it's, and it's proven through other scripture as well that those who are the oppressors are going to be the ones that are I don't know if they're necessarily going to be oppressed, but they're going to be the captives. You know, they're going to be the ones that are not in charge and ruling. The wicked people of the earth right now are the ones who are going to be going after the saints. But the tables are going to turn, and if they make it through the wrath of God, they're going to be at the bottom of the, of, of the spectrum, not at the top. Going back to Isaiah chapter 14, look at verse number 3. The Bible reads, and it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear and from the hard bondage wherein thou wast made to serve that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, how hath the oppressor ceased? The golden city ceased. They're going to be so, people are going to be so happy and so joyful. And again, the dual prophecy is going on here, right? Don't forget that, that you know, they've been full of sorrow. They've been full of fear. They've been full of the hard bondage when they were taken captive. And then when they're freed and Babylon is judged, they're going to say, wow, how is the king of Babylon? Now, how has he finally stopped, right? How is that king of Babylon finally ceased? It's over. It's a great time of joy. But that's also how it's going to be at the millennial reign of Christ as well, because all of the, the martyrdom and all the hardships and persecution and tribulation is going to be over. It's going to be done. And it's going to be a joyful time. Verse number five, the Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hindereth. So the, the, the one who was bringing the wrath, the one who was causing all the problems, now they're the ones being persecuted. And it says, and no one's stopping them, Right? And it's going to continue to happen that, um, that the, the tables have turned. Basically, you know, the king of Babylon, Satan, the wicked people of the earth, they're all going to reap what they've sown. 
because everybody reaps what they sow. Because the Bible says, be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So you whether you reap sin, you, you know, whether you sow sin unto death or whether you sow righteousness unto life, you know, that choice is up to you, but everybody's going to reap what they sow. Everybody does. And then verse 7 says, the whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. And we've already gone through a little bit of the millennial reign in previous chapters a few weeks ago. Um, and just how, how wonderful that's going to be. There's that, that peace and, and uh, tranquility during this millennial reign of Christ. Again, it makes sense. Satan's, Satan's going to be bound, and Jesus is going to be in charge. So, of course, it's going to be a time of rest and quiet and a time that definitely will deserve singing. Look at verse number 8. The Bible says, Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of, excuse me, the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no feller has come up against us. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. All they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? And I'll tell you what, this ought to bring comfort to your hearts, especially if you are ever at the receiving end of extremely wicked people in high positions of power. You may or may not have ever had that experience. I don't know, but a lot of people, a lot of people are oppressed by extremely wicked people in power. And, and lives are destroyed by these evil, wicked rulers of this world that are just extremely reprobate, evil, wicked people. And the Bible's talking about it. And, and oftentimes, those are the people in charge of countries, in charge of nations, right? In these great positions of power. And this is talking about now Satan, the king of Babylon, but, but the king of Babylon referencing Satan being cast down to hell and saying, hey, hell is, is, is moving and opening up for you, Right? To, to just have this grand entrance into hell where you deserve. Finally, hell's going, finally, you're coming to be judged in hell. And, you know, this was, this metaphorically speaking, you know, the hell's stirring up the dead for thee, the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations, all these wicked kings that have lived in the past that thought they were all super mighty and powerful that have been burning in hell. Now we're going to see you know, the, the baddest of the bad, Satan, being cast down into hell, looking at him going, art thou also become weak as we? Even you? Even you, Satan, who has so much power and, and so much might and, and, you know, has directed us, even you're brought down and made weak like we? And, you know, these, these men who think that they're so powerful and so mighty and so strong, they're going to be made really weak in hell their day is coming and we can take comfort knowing that that knowing that the judgment and justice of god that they do not they will not get away with all their wickedness and evil deeds that they do to people and they're not getting away with it art thou also become weak as we art thou become like unto us that's what they're saying look at verse 11 thy pomp is brought down to the grave and the noise of thy vials the worm is spread under thee and the worms cover thee pomp is is um it's just full of, it's pride right the, the the pomp is this this great to do right uh when someone's just just full of pomp or someone's pompous they're full of themselves they're proud they're haughty but but here it says that pomp is brought down to the grave it's you know making a big deal out of himself Right? That would be considered pomp. Someone who's, who's walking around and he has an entourage. Right? The, you, you, could, you could see it in these famous people that, uh, that, that walk around and they've got the fancy clothes and they, talk, they walk a certain way and all cool and they've got the people following them and man, they are just the coolest people in the world and they're just full of pomp. And you know what that is? Vanity 
me, it's, it's completely foolish and stupid and just demonstrates how full of themselves they are. Don't ever act like that. Okay, don't, don't mimic these people that are extremely wicked and full of themselves and walk around like they are just God's gift to everybody and that they're so awesome and they have so much money and they walk around and they're so cool and dope and, you know, whatever. And, yeah, I'm aging myself. Sorry. I, I don't know. I, I'll admit right now I don't know what any of the modern language is. Okay, the old stuff is all I can remember and just the way it is. If you understand what I'm saying, then that's what matters. <laughs> but seriously, like this is, and, and you know what it is though? It's a big facade. It's all fake. It's all fake. Those people that walk around, they think they're so confident and they're so cool. On the inside, they're not that confident. They're just regular, they're, they're, I don't want to say regular, they're just people on the inside still. They like to live this image of how cool it is to be a rock star, to be a movie star, to be whatever, but they're miserable people. Don't be deceived by the image. Satan is a master at making an image and getting people to sin because they fall for the image. Everything about sin is, is vanity and is just a facade and it's fake and it's an image. People commit adultery thinking, oh man, this is going to be so great when I you know, go to bed with someone who's not my spouse and, and this is just going to be, and you know what? It's an image. It's fake. Because then they're going to end up committing the act and it's not going to be all they thought it was going to be. And there's going to be problems and there's going to be, you know, everything else that goes along with this and people are going to realize, man, that was stupid. Or whether it be, you know, fornication, same thing. Whether it be drugs, booze, look, any sin is going to be built up to look like, oh man, I just, I just really want to do that. And then you do it and it's like, well, that was really stupid. Because it's not all it's cracked up to be. And some people just don't get it, and then they continue trying to see, well, no, no, I just, something didn't work out right, or something wasn't right. And you keep on getting diluted by this, the, the fakeness and the fraud of sin. It's nonsense. And, and this proves it too. Satan, you know, he's, he's built up to be this, you know, whatever, like really bad guy and, and powerful being and creature and everything else. And you know what? He's going to be made weak just like all the other wicked kings of the earth were made weak. And they're burning and suffering in hell. And guess what? He's going to be burning and suffering in hell. And he's going to be bound and can't get out and can't do anything about it. And all the lies and all the deception and everything else that he did on earth trying to deceive people, he's not going to be able to do that anymore. He's going to be powerless. You say, why, how do you even know that this is, I mean, this is talking about the king of Babylon. How do you even know this is talking about Satan? Well, verse number 12 says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nation? So that reference there to Lucifer is referring to Satan, which, by the way, in the King James Bible is the only place that you're going to see that name referenced, Lucifer, in the Bible, this is the only time it's found in the scripture. And if you're reading a modern version, you know how many times you're going to see it in scripture? Zero. Zero times. Now, it's evident that Lucifer, it, it, it could be proven that Lucifer is Satan. Uh, one, the context alone just makes sense, right? But even in the name, the, the name Lucifer, we call it son of the morning, Lucifer, the word luz, is the root where Lucifer would come from. Luz means light. So Lucifer would be like a light bearer. Okay. We know, and I don't have the reference here, that the Bible says that, that, um, that it shouldn't surprise us, and this is a, a, a really bad paraphrase, that um, because the, 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 the devil's angels are, are transformed as ministers of light. Right? That, that we shouldn't be surprised 
that you know Satan is an angel of light. He was an angel of light. He's a fallen angel, right? So when God created him, God created Satan very beautifully and very wonderfully, right? But all of that beauty and, and, and wonder went to his head and filled him up with pride. He uh, filled himself with pride until he sinned and wickedness was found in him. Um, but that word Lucifer here, you could see in, you could turn to Luke chapter 10 if you'd like. I'm going to keep reading. Actually, I'm not going to keep reading yet. Turn to Luke chapter 10. Isaiah 14, 12 says, How art thou fallen from heaven? So even just a reference to falling from heaven, it's not talking about a human king. It's not talking about the king of Babylon, right? It's not, a physical king isn't in heaven to fall from. Lucifer, again, makes sense. And he's called son of the morning. But look at what Jesus said about Satan in Luke 10, verse 18. He says, and he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. So the same, the same terminology, falling from heaven, except here he's saying, I beheld or I saw, I witnessed Satan fall from heaven, just as here it says, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? So very clear evidence that Lucifer is referring to Satan. And turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter 22. I want to point out something here as well. And this is a very common reference anyways. Uh, if you're familiar with, with King James only arguments, uh, this is one that's very popular. It comes up frequently, but I'm going to cover it anyways. If you haven't heard this and you don't understand why we're King James only, there's just one more little, little piece of information I already brought up before that the modern versions don't even use the word Lucifer here. You're missing out on, on that information. But instead, what they'll do is I'll read for you from the NIV. Now, not all modern versions read exactly the same way, but the NIV specifically, instead of saying, Lucifer, son of the morning, it says this. It says, how you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. So instead of the word Lucifer, it says morning star, son of the dawn. It says, you have been cast down to the earth. You who once laid low the nations, you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. So there's some similarities there, but I mean, if we're just reading it. You're looking at it going like, that doesn't sound like what we just read in Isaiah 14. But, the fact that it's calling here this reference to, obviously, Satan, okay, being like the Most High, even in the NIV, is, is re then referring to his sins of saying, well, I'm going to be like the Most High, I'm going to ascend to the heavens, is clearly talking about someone who's not Jesus, yet it says morning star here. And in Revelation 22, the Bible says in verse 16, I, Jesus, now, is there any doubt about who's speaking here? I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Jesus Christ is the one in Scripture who's referred to as the morning star, which even the NIV in Revelation 22, 16 says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. So within the NIV itself, you got Jesus being called the morning star, but then you've got someone else being called the morning star in Isaiah 14, who's cast down to hell. Who, who wants to be like the most high and gets punished for wanting to be like the Most High. The NIV is making Jesus and Lucifer interchangeable. It's wicked. It's craziness. I mean, that's, that, and that, you know what? That should show you who's really behind the modern versions. Who's behind the NIV? Well, 
who wants to be like the Most High? Now, inserting Morning Star as being one of his names. Instead of Lucifer. No, no, I'm not Lucifer, I'm the Morning Star. And even just that, the, you know, Lucifer being taken out of this context, you know, there's, there are people out there who are, who are Luciferian in their belief, in their religion, and basically the concept is that Satan, or the devil, Lucifer, is just misunderstood, that he was really a good guy. And they spin it by saying, you know, well, hey, he was just telling Adam and Eve, you know, hey, it's, I mean, it's a good thing to have knowledge, right? So this is what they say. It's good to have knowledge. Right? Even, even God says it's good to have knowledge. Well, he's just pointing them to eat of the knowledge of good and evil. I mean, what, what's so bad about that? He's just helping them out by, by you know, this is, this is that, that way that they, they start to say, oh, see, the, the, really the bad guy is the Lord, and the devil's just completely misunderstood. He's not bad, and, and that's where people come up with this Luciferian doctrine. It's completely twisted, obviously, and, um, and wicked and wrong. But then when you don't even have Lucifer... In the context here, well, I mean, you could say, well, what does the Bible even say about Lucifer? Well, in all the modern versions, you don't even know. Well, it's not even in there. So maybe there is something to this. Maybe it's some secret, hidden, occult knowledge of Lucifer being, you know, no. The real Bible, the Holy Bible, is going to tell you about Lucifer. It's going to tell you about his wickedness. Isaiah 14, stay in Revelation, go to Revelation chapter 12. I'm going to just read a couple more verses from Isaiah 14. So the Bible says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So the devil is full of himself, he's full of pomp, he's full of this arrogance because he wants to be God. He wants to be like God, he wants to be above the throne of God, he wants that spot. It wasn't good enough for him to be, you know, subordinate, essentially. He wants to be the one in charge. But, but when, when is he cast down? And this is... I could understand why people would think, because we've, we have a couple of references here already. We read in, um, in Luke 10, where Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. So that's like a past tense, where I beheld him, where I already saw this. And then in Isaiah 14, 12, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, also is a reference that sounds like it's already happened, Right? So I could understand just having that thought of thinking, well, he must be cast out of heaven already because these both sound like past tense. But very importantly, you, you have to understand, you know, first of all, that, that God speaks of those things that, that are to come as though they already happened. So he speaks about things in the future as if, as if it's already happened. When you read through, especially in Isaiah, you read through the prophecies of Jesus Christ, they read like it's already happened, like Jesus Christ has already been crucified on the cross. right? I mean, there's multiple prophecies like that that talk about, in past tense, Jesus being crucified on the cross when it hasn't even happened yet, and very clearly so. right? So you can't just look at these words and just assume that it's already happened because Jesus, especially being God, you know, knows the beginning from the end. And having already seen things happen doesn't mean they had to have happened yet for him because he's not bound like we are by time in, in the same manner, right? So having understood that, you still have to go back and think and say, okay, well, if he was cast out of heaven, when did that happen? When was he cast out of heaven, right? I mean, some people will say he's cast out of heaven right from the beginning, but that doesn't make any sense because it says that it was until sin was, was found in him, until iniquity was found in him, and we don't see any iniquity found in him until at least the Garden of Eden when he's, when he's convincing 
you know, Adam and Eve to eat of the fruit, Eve specifically, to eat of the fruit, that's when he's, um, you know, we see that there's sin there because up until then, they lived in this perfect garden, there was no sin, and then we see Satan trying to, to tempt Eve in that moment. But then we also see in the book of Job that Satan is appearing before the Lord in heaven. In Job 1 and 2, you can look it up later. We're not going to go over it for sake of time tonight. You can look that up and see he presents himself and, and he's, you know, God asks him, so where are you coming from? He goes, oh, from going up and, up and down through the earth and you know, walking to and fro through the earth, just, just, just wandering around. And he's going back and forth, apparently, between heaven and earth. So obviously, if God's talking to him and allowing him to go back and forth with earth, he hasn't been cast out of heaven yet. So that's, I mean, that's much later. Jesus is talking to, to Satan on the earth, but there's no indication that he's cast out of heaven yet. And if we look at Revelation chapter 12, we're going to see, I believe very clearly, showing us that when Satan is cast out of heaven, that he's going to come with fierce wrath on the people, and that's going to kick off the great tribulation because he knows that he has a short time. So if he was cast out of heaven thousands of years ago, that's not a short time. If he was cast out of heaven, we don't see him having the same wrath that's expressed that we're going to see in Revelation 12. I'm just, I'm just putting this forward before I actually look at the scripture. We, we don't see these things happening. It doesn't make any sense to think. So the logical conclusion is going to be, well, he hasn't been cast out of heaven yet. Because when he does get cast out of heaven, he's going to be uh, really angry at that. And, and he's going to uh, bring forth severe persecution against the children of God. Look at Revelation chapter 12. We'll start reading verse number 1. The Bible reads, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars, and she being with child cried, traveling in birth, and pained to be delivered. Now, just real quick, this is going to cover, uh, uh, this actually, Revelation 12, is going to cover a large span of time in a very short period of, of verses. Right? This is going from like the birth of Jesus Christ all the way to these end times events in, in a very short period of time. Because Revelation 12 is kind of a reset in the book of Revelation, you got the first 11 chapters, and then it starts over, you get a reset, and then it goes through. But the focus of Revelation is all end times events. So when it kind of triggers back to the birth of Christ, it fast forwards real fast to then cover end times events more in detail you know, in, in, the, in the remaining uh, chapter, the re remaining book to, to come. So, it, it's talking here, being with child, traveling in birth, pain to be delivered, verse 3, and there appeared another wonder in heaven, behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So this is talking about Satan ready to destroy Jesus as soon as it was born. But notice when it says he drew the third part of the stars of heaven, this is, I believe it's referring to angels. I think it's a very commonly held belief that, that the, the stars being drawn to heaven uh, are, are the angels that were in heaven and did cast them to the earth. But this isn't God casting them to the earth. This is the dragon casting them to the earth. I mean, this is the dragon saying, come down here, right, and bringing his devils with him to the earth, which is evidenced when Jesus was walking on the earth. You had so many people, you know, possessed with devils, and we could see them walking around and everything else. Um, so we don't see God actually kicking them out of heaven here. We see the devil calling them down out of heaven. But even at least up to this point, up until the birth of Christ, we know that the devil has been in heaven. And he wasn't kicked out yet because the devils were still in heaven. He comes down in order to destroy Jesus. Verse 5 says, And she brought forth a man-child who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God into his throne. So already now the death, burial, and resurrection has already happened. Right? You catch that? Verse 6, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there for a thousand two hundred and three score days. 
So all of these things happened. Then it says in verse 7, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. This is the event now with this war in heaven with Michael and his archangels and Satan and that beast and the devil. This definitely happens after the resurrection of Christ. I mean, we can see that. This is all chronologically happening. This is what we're being told is happening. And then verse 9 says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So now this is God casting him out. This isn't the beast dragging the angels with him to earth to, to devour the Son of God. This is God casting him out after the resurrection, after that's already happened. Verse 10 says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. So the devil is an accuser. He's accusing the brethren. He's accusing the saints before God all the time. Guess what he's doing right now? He did that to Job. He was accusing Job to God. Oh, man, if you, if you touch him, then he's going to curse you to your face. Oh, you take away what he has. You just made him real comfortable, God. But if you do that, he's going to curse you, God. He's going to turn his back on you. He's going to have nothing to do with you. He's accusing him. He's falsely accusing him. He was wrong about it. He's wicked. And that's what he's doing all the time. And now it's a joy because, hey, he's finally kicked out of heaven. Now we don't have to listen to Satan just accusing the brethren day in and day out before the Lord. What a, what a twerp. I mean, what a punk. Go tattling on people, trying to tell on people, trying to cause bad things to happen. But that's why when people really see when he's cast on hell, it's going to be like, oh, it's just you? Oh, you, you're weak too? We'll keep reading here, verse, uh, verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. But then look at what it says here. So the heaven's great. I mean, everyone's happy in heaven because he's cast out. But then it says, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. The devils knew that there's a time appointed unto them, as I already referenced. How you come to torment us before the time is what they would say to Jesus, because they know there's a time appointed for them to face hell, because they know God created hell for them. The sin happened way early on. The sin happened. But the, the, the punishment of being cast into hell did not happen yet. It still hasn't happened yet for the devil and his angels. It's there, it's ready, it's prepared, but they have not been cast into hell yet. But woe unto the earth when the devil finally does get kicked out of heaven because then he's going to know, I don't have much time left before I'm getting thrown into that lake of fire, before I'm getting thrown into hell. I don't have much time. And then he's angry and he's going to take out his anger on the children of God on this earth. And that's the great tribulation. The Bible says in verse 13, And when the dragon saw that he was cast under the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. I'm not going to get into all of that, but basically, you know, the, the woman is, is essentially Israel giving forth. I mean, that was, he was born of that seed, but it's spiritual Israel. It's, 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 you know, God was brought forth, Jesus was brought forth, unto the woman, and now he's, in, you know, he's going back now to persecute the people of God. Real simply, that's what he's, that's what he's going to do. I'm not going to get into all the details of that, but uh, let's go back to Isaiah chapter 14. There's still more stuff I want to get into here. But I think it's pretty evident we could see when Satan is going to be cast out of heaven, that he hasn't been cast out yet. No, it, it wouldn't make sense. There'd be too many other contradictions to come up with a different time of when Satan could have already been cast out. 
Because then how is this going to make sense? And how could you say he has but a short time if you already think he's been cast out like, you know, when Jesus was born or when, you know, whenever, whenever, whenever you think it was, how is that a short time? If you think about it, the grand, even just the grand scheme of things in the, in the lifetime of this earth, you know, we're looking at 6,000 years. So if, if Satan's been cast out for thousands of years already, you can't call that a short time. Because even on a big scale, you say, well, one day is with the Lord, is with a thousand years, a thousand years, like a day, maybe it's the same thing with Satan. Well, no, first of all, that's what the Lord says. Satan is a created being. He's not God or a God. So you can't just apply something that applies to God to Satan, first of all. But second of all, the world isn't going to be around that much longer. It's already been 6,000 years. So if you say he's already been cast out for thousands of years, how can you say he's got a short time? That doesn't even make sense. Half the time of the entire existence of this earth is a short time? It's not a short time. Or a third or whatever. I mean, that's not a short time. A short time is going to be like maybe a couple years on the grand scheme of things for someone who's been around for that long. That's a short time. Back to Isaiah 14, look at verse number 15. The Bible says, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? Again, like, this is him? That's it? And when it says they're going to narrowly look on him, it's like this. Right? They're squinting at him going like, You? Wait, it's You? You cause all these problems. You're the reason why I'm here. And we have contempt. And you look narrowly on them because they can't believe, like, you deceived me? This is why I'm here? Is this the man that made the whole earth to tremble? I mean, people just put into fear. And when they see him, it's going to be like, wait, it's just you? It's, it's the man behind the curtain in The Wizard of Oz. Right? If you didn't see the movie, it just I mean, there's, there's this great big wizard's great big face and this great booming voice and everything, but it's all just theater. Yeah. Right? And people are all scared, you know, the, the Dorothy and the, you know, people are they're all scared and trembling because they think it's this mighty wizard and her, you know, and then it's like, it's just some little guy behind the curtain. Like, oh, it's just you? That's what it's going to be like with, with Satan being cast down into hell. People are just going to look and be like, wow, you made the earth to tremble. And, you know, we're not going to be the ones in hell seeing that, but we can take comfort in this knowing, you know what? You don't have to have that, that fear of the devil. Because he's not all that. Now, he may be a powerful creature that's, you know, and angels have, have different powers that, that, that God has given them over, uh, over us in general, that, that humans don't have the same type of power, but we don't have to fear him. One, we've got our strength in the Lord. Anyways, no matter who or what kind of creature or anything that's going to come against us, we could just rest in the Lord. But two, he's not all that scary in the end anyways because it's just a big fake. It's a big front. It's a big facade. He says, is this the man that made the earth tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the, whole, the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof that opened not the house of his prisoners. Even just that phrase that made the world as a wilderness, that's a lot of destruction coming from him. And I, I just can't help but think about the satanic Georgia Guidestones that talk about, you know, reducing the population and all this other stuff to, for Mother Nature and everything else. That's satanic. God said, be fruitful and multiply. God's given man dominion over the earth and, and wants you to be fruitful, wants you to increase, wants you to multiply. And it's a satanic concept to make the world a wilderness. And that's what the Bible says here about Satan himself. Made the world as a wilderness. 
and destroyed the cities thereof, and opened not the house of his prisoners. All the kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory, every one in his own house. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch, and as the raiment of those that are slain, thrust through with a sword that go down to the stones of the pit, as a carcass trodden under feet. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. Prepare slaughter for his children, for the iniquity of their fathers, that they do not rise, nor possess the land, nor fill the face of the world with cities. Now, I just want to point out one more time, you know, there is dual prophecy going on here. So the king of Babylon is facing, you know, something similar to this. Obviously, there's a foreshadowing with, with Satan and the mention of Lucifer and everything else. But this still also is going to be at least dually applied to, uh, to an older uh, prophecy as well that's already happened. Isaiah 14, verse number 22, Bible says, For I will rise up against them, saith the Lord of hosts, and cut off from Babylon the name and remnant and son and nephew, saith the Lord. I will also make it a possession for the bittern and pools of water, and I will sweep it with the besom of destruction, saith the Lord of hosts. You say, Basil, what's a besom? I had to look it up because I didn't know offhand either. It's a broom. That's all it is. Makes sense, right? Sweeping, sweeping with the besom of destruction. Just an old word for a broom. Um, verse 24, the Lord of hosts hath sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass, and as I have purposed, so shall it stand, that I will break the Assyrian in my land, and upon my mountains tread him underfoot. Then shall his yoke depart from off them, and his burden depart from off their shoulders. This is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth. And, that, and this is the hand that it is stretched out upon all the nations. For the Lord of hosts hath purposed, and who shall disannul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? In the year that King Ahaz died was this burden. So again, making reference to the same year that King Ahaz died, this burden, what's this burden? The burden of Babylon that we saw starting in the previous chapter. And so he brings up the Assyrian even also, because Assyrian is going to come in and they're going to uh, fight against, the, against Babylon. But then at the end of the day, God's just going to judge everybody anyways. God judges them all. He uses wicked nations to bring judgment on other wicked nations. He uses wicked nations to bring judgment on less wicked nations, but ones that he still wants to judge. Like it's his people that just turn their back on the Lord. They may not even have been as wicked as some of these other people have, but you know what? God says, you're going to be judged, so he's going to bring in these people, but then he's going, well, but you're still extremely wicked, so I'm going to judge you, and everybody ends up getting what they deserve according to the Lord. So let's finish off this chapter here, verse number 29. Rejoice not thou, whole Palestina, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and his fruit it shall be a fiery flying serpent. And the firstborn of the poor shall feed, and the needy shall lie down in safety. And I will kill thy root with famine, and he shall slay thy remnant. Howl, O gate, cry, O city, thou whole Palestina art dissolved. For there shall come from the north a smoke, and none shall be alone in his appointed times. What shall one then answer the messengers of the nation? that the Lord hath founded Zion, and the poor of his people shall trust in it. And it's, leave, it's ending up this, this passage with the hope for Zion, right? Which is the city for the people of God, and, and you know, ultimately saying, you know, the day of the Lord's going to come from the previous chapter. He's going to bring destruction on all these people who are, who are laying waste to God's people and God's heritage. And God's going to end up basically judging everyone, and his people are going to end up dwelling in safety. And as this also prophesies the day of the Lord, God's wrath, and then the millennial reign of Christ, we also can rest in that coming time of peace and prosperity and safety and that Zion being set up and the Lord Jesus Christ ruling and reigning for a thousand years on this earth. So there's definitely a lot of comfort to be had in this chapter 
for us. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. We thank you for all the things we could learn. And Lord, th your book is so dense and so deep. There's so many topics and so many things that we could have looked into and studied out more. God, I pray that you please open up our, our, our knowledge, our understanding. Help us as we study your words to just to learn more and to glean more and to make more applications and more references and understand uh, all the things that we can learn from your words, dear God. Um, there's so much here. Uh, we love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.